members. Sorry. Great. So the vote on the substantive motion, uh, all of those in favour? That is 26 in favour. Thank you, Chair. And against? Not against. Any abstentions? With two abstentions. Thank you, Chair. Two abstentions. So, members, we've uh, discussed that for an hour and a half now. So, having discussed it for an hour and a half, I will adjourn the meeting for 15 minutes. Um, please, can you be back at 10 to 4? Thank you.
switch my microphone on. Uh, agenda item number six, the council constitution. Uh, Councillor Pierce to introduce. Thank you, Chairman. Um, you have before you this afternoon, members, chapters four, five, six, and seven, as set out in Appendix A for this report. Now, I'm afraid, but because they have all been loaded, um, Appendix A and Appendix B, but they haven't been loaded individually, I'm not going to give you a list because if I do, I'm going to miss something out because I haven't got the um, the email in front of me with all the um, the attachments named individually. Um, but you know that we, since over a year now, we have been uh, gradually adopting um, parts of the constitution. These are the final parts. So if we can get these adopted today. Links. As it is meant to use, and finally, it will stop being a ring binder constitution and be a fully um, a digital constitution, which will be better for all of us. Um, I'm sure that some of you will have questions on parts of that, and uh, Mr. Fairburn will be here to um, answer those. So please don't address your questions to me, but. We'll move that afterwards and then we'll go into any debate. Um, so the recommendation has been proposed. Do we have a second after the recommendation? Seconded by Councillor Baston. Um, so we move into the debate. Councillor Burke. Yeah, I, I have a few amendments. Uh, Um, can I just say, I've, I, I hope you don't mind me sitting, but I've got some papers that makes it easier for me to go through the paperwork. Um, there are a... <laughs> no, I'm not. The Birch, I have no objection to you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It's a good start, isn't it? <laughs> right. Um, I Can I just say that I had a uh, discussion earlier this week uh, with Mr. Fer Uh, some proposed changes. Now, what um, <clears throat> we'll do is highlight those few areas where I think it needs further consideration. And rather than um, uh, propose an amendment, um, what I'd like to, what I will propose is that the areas that I've highlighted that Uh, be referred to the leaders of the political groups to discuss with Mr. Fairburn in the hope that they can come with an agreement back to the next full council um, rather than have a debate here and now. So the, the first um, area of concern is on page 45 and 46. Um, which is budget and policy framework procedure rules. Now, this sets out the um, uh, this sets out the uh, procedure for setting the budget. Now, as members will be aware, um, the normal procedure or the procedure this council has adopted in the past is that there is a joint meeting of DMC and overview and scrutiny, and they put to, to their uh, proposals or recommendations to the executive. And the thinking behind that is that it would give all members an opportunity to have input into the budget. The, what is set out in these uh, budget and policy framework procedure rules, it does away with that. The, in other words, there wouldn't be a, a joint meeting of uh, D DMC and overview and scrutiny. I think this needs to be looked at again, and I think this is a, a matter that 
ought to be the subject of the discussion that I mentioned earlier. So that's number one. And number two is the uh, through number two is throughout the document. And perhaps I can give you an example on page 107. Throughout the document, there is reference to the hub committee at um, West Devon. Uh, for example, at 6.2, it says a section 151 officer will advise the council uh, through the hub committee brackets West Devon or the executive brackets South Ham's close brackets as appropriate. And there are quite a few instances within the, the document that makes reference to the hub committee. Now, I'm not certain as to whether or not the uh, ruling party have uh, got some plans to uh, have the two councils merge. Um, perhaps if they have, they could let us know. But in any event, I think any reference at this stage uh, to West Devon and in particular the Hub Committee should be deleted from the document. Um, next is uh, on page 143, which deals with uh, partnerships. Uh, and this deals where this deals with those uh, those joint arrangements that the councils may have respect of partnerships and in particular it's the partnership between the, this council and uh, and uh, West Devon and at 17.5 it says uh, for West Devon the overview and scrutiny committee shall be responsible for the monitoring of the partnership arrangements in accordance with the council's partnership policy so my question is why are West Devon's overview and scrutiny allowed to uh, monitor the partnership arrangement as opposed to South Ham's? Uh, is there something? Uh, I, don't, I don't know what. I don't think um, when I asked Mr. Fairburn, I don't think he had the answer to that. Uh, so I think that needs uh, looking at. And finally, at Appendix B, uh, this is the document where the uh, value of delegated decisions are considerably increased. I won't go through uh, the uh, each and every one, but there are a considerable number. And as a result of that, there are uh, consequences flowing from that, such, for example, the financial limit in respect of key decisions is raised considerably. And the consequence of that is that it almost uh, extinguishes, uh, in many cases, the right of overview and scrutiny to call in decisions of the executive. So I think that is another area that needs to be looked at. So I, the areas that I mentioned, I would uh, propose uh, that they be, uh, that the leaders of the political groups meet with Mr. Fairburn to seek to reach an agreement on those particular areas and bring those back to uh, uh, full council. Otherwise, I'm happy to support the uh, the rest of the, the document. Thank you have you. a second, Councillor. Councillor Thomas, second. Uh, Mr. Fairburn, would you like to speak to the proposal? The amendment. Yes, thank you. I mean, thank you, Chairman. Um, the re I don't really wish, wish to reopen the debate here. Um, Councillor Birch and I did go through the, the points that he makes. Um, I am happy to take on board members' further thoughts and considerations at, at any time, I should stress. Um, Certainly, in terms of the references to West Devon and Hub Committee, um, I my view there is that the the guidance is intended to be guidance by the Section One Five One officer um, as a joint set of guidance, um, and way around that would be to potentially make um, add a paragraph at the beginning to explain um, the various references. Um, but if, if if members are quite happy to um, agree the constitution as drafted today. I'm happy to have a conversation. If other group leaders are happy to have a conversation, as I say, I'm happy to have a conversation at any time. Do other any members want to uh, speak on the amendment? <coughs> other than okay, Councillor Pierce. So Councillor Pierce. Uh, 
Thank you, um, Chairman. Um, I too had a few um, remarks to make to Mr. Ferber, which I sent him in an email, which he received um, very graciously. Um, I was under the impression that we had already delegated to the monitoring officer the right to make minor amendments because this is a living document without having to come back all the time. Um, and I think that uh, uh, there are um, several things here, like the references to um, South Hams and West Devon, which could be um, amended easily under those um, regulations. As to the um, budget setting rules, now um, this, I suppose, has come back to bite me a little bit because I remember I was the person who instituted having a joint overview and scrutiny and DM meeting before the budget um, to so that um, all backbenchers would have a vote before council on what they wanted to see in the budget. Now, I suppose in my older and wiser times, I now see that actually all you were doing, you know, it. Um, and so then those recommendations would go up to the executive, where I know there's an accommodating chairman of the committee who would allow any members to speak. So, and then it goes up to council, where I know we have a very accommodating chairman who lets everybody speak. So really, um, I think in the modern, well, in, in this system where we can all sit at home in our, on our sofa and, and join a meeting by teams, if it's one where you don't have to vote, you're actually at an advantage because you don't have to come into the meeting. So possibly there's an advantage to not instigating that. Um, but, but in any case, I think that could be reviewed at a later time. I'm now actually keen to get this, this constitution adopted. And so um, I am going to recommend that we do not take up Councillor Birch's um, amendments because I think they can be done as we go along. I take note of them, yes, and I'm quite happy to talk about it in the group, and I'm quite happy then for the group to make a recommendation to Mr Fairburn. He could then change the constitution, as he is allowed to do, and then inform all members that it's been done. End of story. Um, and if he's got recommendations from all the group leaders that that's what they want to do, I'm sure that's what he will do. So that's my view on the matter. So, members, you have an amendment before you. I'm looking to move to the vote on the amendment, which you can see on the screen. Um, so, those in favour of the amendment. That's 11 in favour of the amendment. Thank you, Chair. And those against? And 17 against. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. So we move back to the substantive motion. Um, do any members wish to debate the substantive motion any further who haven't already spoken? In which case, Councillor Baldry. Chairman, I'm very sorry you rejected what I thought was a very sensible amendment. I'm going to vote against now constitution because I cannot accept the increased level in of delegated authority, which are absolutely astronomical increase. I'm not happy about them. I'm going to vote against. Okay, so we will then move to the substantive motion uh, for which we have a proposer and a seconder. Um, so we'll be moving to the vote on that. Um, so all of those in favour of the substantive motion. That's 17 in favour of the motion. Thank you, Chair. And those against? With 11 against. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. So item number seven, fusion uh, solar investment proposal. Uh, I'll ask Councillor Holwell to introduce the report as the member on the executive. Uh, you need to switch your microphone on as well. Yeah, I just want to move it down a bit. And I'll... Go ahead. We'll be there in a minute, don't worry. 
Yeah, we will. Thank you. I want to start at the beginning. Oh, I lost my. What's a bit just up there? Yeah. Yeah. That's odd. Why is that? Yeah. Oh, all right. Ah, oh, real. Okay. The recommendation of the members is that Council approves the change to the funding proposals to facilitate the investment in and installation of solar panels on the Council's four leisure centres such that, one, the Council funds the acquisition of the solar panels direct as part of the capital programme for 22-23, instead of making a loan to Fusion to do the same, and approves a capital budget of £500,000 for solar panel investment on the council's leisure centres, funded by either Public Works Loan Board borrowing or internal borrowing, depending on prevailing interest rates. And two, a separate management agreement is drawn up between the council and Fusion to the benefit of the council, so that the council annually receives an income payment from Fusion the same amount of the repayments and the council would have that the council would have received from fusion from the loan repayment um, you can read them Tom up there they're white I could couldn't I go on yeah. we, we could as members could. well I can as well yeah. sorry you don't need us to read them two grants an exemption to its procurement rules that so that it can rely upon the procurement that Fusion have undertaken to get a contractor ready to install the panels price three. Three delegates approval to the section 151 officer in consultation with the leader, the lead executive member for climate change, and the director of place and enterprise to agree any necessary contract amendment. Management agreement between Fusion and the council referred to in one two above and the structure of the borrowing referred to in one one above as part of the council's overall capital program. Thank you. Do members have any questions on agenda item number seven? Councillor Hodgson. All right. Thanks. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, I'd like to ask um, if it's part is, is the, yeah, he's the books here. Good. Um, a few years ago, I organised a meeting with um, a representative professor, Mr Ian Bright, who was offering to put uh, solar panels on the pavilions in Totnes and has since indicated that he would have been willing with um, Professor, which is Totnes Renewable Energy Society, to install solar panels on the other leisure centres in the South Hams. There would have been no charge, no, no outlay, no capital outlay for this. Um, what they would have done would have provided the solar panels on the roofs. This is going back probably about five years. The roofs, and instantly we would have been benefiting, obviously, from the renewable energy being generated in terms of just the, the wider benefits of not having climate emergencies so quickly. But on top of that, the, uh, the leisure centres themselves would have had the benefit of reduced cost electricity. And the hit would have been taken by Tresoc, and they would have also made then difference in, in price from the effects, etc. So it would have been win-win. And we could have started that five years ago. I have on repeated occasions, as has Mr Bright, tried to find out what's happening with that. And he has basically just been dumped. He has heard nothing more. And I would like to ask, um, why not Tresoc five years ago and or more recently? Secondly, um, why has an assessment been made of the difference in overall costings? In other words, the difference between us having to borrow £500,000 and all the other costs associated with that rather than a, a free um, installation. And then the, the timeline and income over, say, the next 10, 20 years of the difference in income compared to the actual outlay in the first instance. I think this is quite a serious matter. We've just lost, lost nearly 500,000 in the last couple of weeks over a, um, an appalling situation with Aldi. And I think that we need to some answers before we go ahead on the next 500 grand that we spend. Because I think we've had an opportunity here not have to spend that not have to not have to um, borrow it we could actually use one of our local group local companies and it would be benefiting everybody and they have the um, knowledge um the back, background and the, and the membership and it benefits local members too 
I think we should be looking very closely at how we do our procurement. And I think that we've had a real opportunity. We go, don't go ahead with that. It's an opportunity missed. Thank you. Mr. Brook. Thank you, Chairman. Um, members will know, and this came up in the last meeting, so members will know that um, the, the ability to put solar panels on the centre in Totnes is challenging because of the potential for future improvement works which will affect the roof line. So the timeline for doing this has been set by that, local members, the community, residents, and, and, and I think probably most people here are keen to see investment and improvements in our leisure centres, not wishing to speak for you. So of course, doing anything in the last five years that would have prevented that would have been counterintuitive. Um, Dressock have their own agenda, rightly so. Good for them, it's a positive agenda that doesn't make them the best supply chain or the best supplier or partner for us. Fusion conducted the procurement process here. It's one of the issues that needs to be debated and discussed and members will take a view on whether that's appropriate. Um, their model, I actually believe, will be very challenging here. If you look at the technical data, which I have, and some of which is included in the report, you can see that the majority, the vast majority of all power generated by the solar panels will be consumed by the leisure centres themselves. It varies, but it's like 10%. They're back to the grid, perhaps as much as that. So Dressock's model, I suspect, would not have worked in this location. Um, for that, for them to decide, but I still think it would have been challenging. So uh, it's not a conspiracy. It's nothing, I'm not trying to do anything odd here. Um, it's just not the way forward in this case. Right. Thank you. Any other questions regarding Councillor Hodgson? I asked for the financial modelling on this. Uh, Mrs Buckle, would you be able to give us any update on that? Yes, thank you, gentlemen. Yes, so um, there was an exempt appendix um, attached to the original report on this, which went to the executive in April, um, and that showed the financial modelling. Um, this arrangement would exactly model that, which was in the previous um, exempt report, um, and therefore the decision is around um, this, the proposal before members is to, is to put this as part of the capital programme. So the council would incur that capital expenditure direct itself rather than um, through a loan structure. Th there would be a decision to make around do, do we externally borrow for that through the PWB or do we use internal borrowing? So internal borrowing would be that you're borrowing from your, your own level of reserves. Um, and treasury management investments at the moment internal borrowing would be the cheaper option um, when a when a council funds their capital program you fund that in its entirety so you don't specifically attach borrowing to specific projects it, it's done uh, as part of the capital program as a whole um, and at the moment internal borrowing um, for a level of 500,000 would probably be uh, the, the cheaper option um, and one that I would recommend at the moment, if PWLB borrowing rates were to change um, or base rates change, then then that can change. And at any point, you can borrow for your capital programme through the through the Public Works Loan Board. Um, but essentially, this the recommendations before you exactly mirror the previous ones that were considered by council. It's just a slightly different structure in that the council would be uh, doing the investment direct through its own capital programme. Thank you. Councillor Smadden. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. Um, I wonder uh, is, if it's not commercially uh, confidential, etc. Mr. Brook is able to tell us, um, you know, which firm will be um, putting the uh, panels on if that contract has been awarded already. Uh, Mr. Brook. Hey, Chairman. Apologies for the delay. Um, yes, it's it's a local firm based in Abbot called Calidus. Local to us, but not local in their reach. Okay. Um, so, members, you have the recommendation before you. Uh, question from Councillor Hodgson. Thank you, Chairman. I can't see this exempt report that you're referring to with the ex with the um, April executive agenda. I was actually it's the comparative I was looking for. What what is the difference? How much more is it costing us than actually using a company that was just going to install them but no charge to them? And in terms of what income we may get. You're reckoning that they that maybe invest as 10% income after what the the, the, uh, the leisure centre would use. 
and I, I wonder what the difference is. And it just seems to me that we're still spending 500,000 that we may not have to. But we've had an offer that was based on a, um, a not-for-profit organisation. Uh, Mr Brunk, would you like to respond to that? Hey, Chairman. Um, sorry, I'm, I think I've been, I've probably put myself across less clearly than I had hoped. Um, so I think it's of the order of 10% of the power as opposed to 10% of any income. So if you have, the example I mean here, to prove to, to, you put your solar panels on a house, then you probably use a, let's just say half that power yourself and half of it goes back into the grid. And you benefit from the food-in tariff to the tune of half of that amount of power you generated, so half of your four kilowatt array. And there are companies out there like Tresoc and others that would happily fund that, knowing that they will make reasonable return in the long term on a very reliable investment over 25 years because they will benefit from the feed-in tariff. If, however, you use all of the power or 90% of the power, as is probably the case here, the feed-in tariff element is very, very small. So if you're having to invest, say, £125,000 on a solar array on the roof of the leisure centre, and then your payback is, say, five years because you are not having to buy electricity over that time, but you're not exporting any, then there is no payback for, in this example, Tressock to make any money. That's why it's only an assumption of mine, but I believe it's a reasonably founded one, that the model they are they rely on in other situations would be challenging to make work in economic terms here. That's what I meant. But in terms of the model that um, is being asked for, no, we don't have that. Thank you, okay, do we have uh, Council of Brazil? Um, yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, and I don't really want to get involved in, in the argument about Tressock or whatever, because I mean, overall, I think in a, in a the principle of this is, is good news, and, and I'm very happy to support it. Um, although, having said that, I'm a little bit confused that somehow, if we pay the money and we get it back from Fusion, the Tressock, if they did it, they wouldn't get any money back. So, I'm not quite sure how that works, because presumably. We put it up, Fusion use the energy, but they pay us for using that energy. That would be the same for Tress But anyway, um, just say, yeah, look, I think this is something that's good. I think hopefully it will be the start of, of this council, um, uh, you know, looking to expand this kind of projects across many of the buildings, not including agricultural buildings that we have in the area, um, because it's it's the way forward. And I'm it's just saddens me that we haven't um, as a country, we haven't done it before, and, and uh, you know, and it's good that we're doing it uh, now here. So I'll be definitely supporting this. Thank you. So, do we have a proposal for the motion, Councillor Hallwell? Do we have a second? Second, Councillor Hawkins. Um, so we move into the debate. Do any other councillors wish to discuss the the recommendation before us, Councillor Hawkins? Uh, can I just uh, thank Councillor Brazil for his positive comments? In my view, yes, this should be the beginning of fitting solar panels on all the properties the Southampton Council own. That's the way forward. We've got to do that for all of our benefits. Uh, we've been pushing this um, investment in our leisure centres for several years now, and I'm glad we're actually here to actually do it. Uh, it's long overdue, and uh, I wish uh, we get the panels on there as fast as possible on all four leisure centres. And it's a good news story. Councillor Sweet. Thank you. Um, yeah, this is overall really brilliant news. It feels like it's been a long time coming and it's been an aspiration since my time as a town councillor and a member of the public. I mean, it is a total no brainer that considering the leisure centres have long been known to be a major one of the major carbon emitters of, of the council. I think it's just over a third, as far as I can remember. Um, you know, this this is well overdue. I would have hoped that it would have moved forward a bit quicker, but I think with COVID, it didn't and was on the back burner. Um, when we had our leisure centre task and finish group, I, I remember it was me really pushing. You know, all all of those um, all those sessions we had and talked with the leisure centres. It was myself and both Jackie and Joseph who who you know brought this up at every single possible opportunity. And you know, it took a while to get there, but you know, I really think that's worth mentioning. And also thank you to Tressock because they were actually in the beginning a real sort of major player in, in sort of bringing all the ideas and inspiration. So although they have weren't awarded the contract, I think they definitely need a mention there. And yeah, it's, it's going to be it's a good thing. And that's correct, Judy. And it would be amazing to see this sort of rolled out further and further as far as it can go on all our buildings. Thank you. 
Councillor Holway, you do have the right to conclude the debate, should you wish to, being the proposer. Uh, yeah, Councillor Hodge, you. sorry, Councillor Hodgson, would just like to speak. Thank you. Yeah, I am actually very disappointed. It's not um, followed up with a local organisation, as I say, one that for five years has been trying to help us. I am concerned that we're, right, we're, we're spending money when, in fact, we've had an offer, which I mean, I, I hear what um, Ms. Brooks was saying. I did actually understand that it was 10% of the power rather than the money. I can think in um, carbon um, money as, as, a, as a system as well. Um, but I just think it's, I just, I wonder really about our whole procurement policy, because I mean, one thing about local, I mean, this has been brought up under the climate emergency thing, which is fantastic, of course. I mean, like uh, Councillor Sweet has said, it's something that we've been talking around for a long time. I think one of the first things I ever brought up when I became a district councillor in 2011, actually, was what about our leisure centres and, and solar power. Um, but I do think it's it's something that is it's not just about trying to get the cheapest or whatever. I mean, in this case, we seem to be spending the money. But I think actually it's about using local organisations as well, because localism is a really clear part of the climate support work that we can do and part of our resilience. So I will say that I will be supporting this for obvious reasons, but it's with, it is with a sort of certain amount of um, bad feeling, actually. And I would like to hope that um, Trustor will be contacted and thanked for their input to date. Thank you. Councillor Holway, would you like to conclude the debate before we move to the vote? Thank you, Chairman. Just very briefly, um, I think it, it is obviously a good scheme. We work very closely with Fusion, and I think under the circumstances, it's quite right for us to retain the benefits for ourselves and or Fusion as we go forward. We want to operate the leisure centres and we've seen what's happening to the price of fuel. It's going up and up and up and it's vitally important that we do this. Now, Tressop and other organisations do a fantastic job and I'm reminded that there was a time when they wanted to have some wind generators and I would like to think that as we go forward, we can support that kind of scheme that central government will in fact encourage all of us to have onshore wind in certain places. And then that would be a genuine scheme for Tressock to make a little, I say make money themselves. They're not in it to make money, but they are provide, they can provide a service to our residents and hopefully provide them with cheaper fuel as well. Thank you. So members, you have the recommendation before you, and I will uh, move to the vote now. All those in favour? That is 26 in favour. Yeah. And those against? None against. Any abstentions? No abstentions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. So we move on to agenda item number eight, appointment of the licensing committee substitute members and the six month member meeting attendance rule uh, to be introduced by Councillor Pierce. Oh, I'm having to revert to a piece of paper because I can't get onto the right page, dodging around three lots of the agenda. Um, right, so this has come about because we're now allowed to have substitutes, but we had only appointed substitutes to um, the main committees. In other words, overview and scrutiny and um, um, DN. And we then scurried around and got some substitutes for audit. And then we had a bit of a crisis um, after um, the council, the annual council in May, because there was a licensing committee, which in the event was not quorate, um, because um, certain members got stuck on a train, um, certain members couldn't turn up for various reasons. Um, we did on our side manage to scurry around and get enough substitutes in for our members, but I'm afraid the other side didn't manage that. So um, they are now naming their substitutes and they've kind of done it in a block version. They've put them all on, but um, the problem with that is that they may not all have done the training. And so we're back to square one until those um, members that have volunteered 
uh, from the opposition to go on the licensing committee as subs. I've done the training. I know that the two members nominated by the Conservative group, which is why we nominated them, have done the training, so they're OK. Um, the other part of this is in um, regards of Kate Kemp, who has signed herself off sick for six months, but the six months have not yet completed. Um, it was thought wise by Democratic Services to bring it to this committee, but um, it was also pointed out that she would have the possibility of coming to the DM committee at the end of this month that would um, stop her um, six month absence. And I was keen that actually we shouldn't take a decision on this until the six months had run and the position was irrevocable. So I've asked that it comes back to September Council and we'll then decide what we're going to do about it, if anything. So um, I don't know whether anybody wants to ask any questions, but I, I, I think because there won't be an awful lot of debate and I hope not many questions, I'll move the recommendations now and they are the three as set out before you. Do I have a seconder? Seconded. Do the members have any questions? Councillor McKay. There you go. Are there any further questions from members? Well, what was the question, Councillor Payne? And therefore, what is the question? All right, Councillor Brazil. Yeah. Sorry, Chairman, it, it's my fault. I, I thought it would be a nice surprise for them. <laughs> <laughs> so the the agenda item has been proposed and seconded. Do any members wish to debate the agenda item any further? Councillor Thomas. Mr Chairman, I don't wish to debate, but just on a point of information for the leader, um, I am a member of the licensing committee. It's a responsibility I take enormously seriously, not least because in a previous life I was a designated premises supervisor for a professional football club, so I know all about licensing. I think members ought to be aware that the last meeting at which a number of members couldn't attend was called at even by short notice standards, extraordinarily short notice, due to an unfortunate officer malfunction, which we don't need to go into. So I do think it is slightly unfair uh, to, to, to chastise members for not having turned up. I think it's an excellent idea to have substitutes, um, but I do think it should be pointed out that members of the licensing committee take their responsibilities very seriously under the chairmanship of Councillor Brown, and, and on that occasion, we just could not make the quorum. But I, I do think it's slightly unfair to suggest there was anything untoward. I'm sure Councillor Brown would like to add to that. Councillor Brown. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, first of all, I fully support this as chair of uh, licensing due to the issues that we've had recently. Um, I'm afraid the what Councillor Thomas said wasn't completely accurate. It wasn't an officer malfunction, to my knowledge. There was a member of the opposition who, did, who didn't turn up, who has now emailed me to explain uh, why they were unable to uh, attend, and I accept that. I accept that rationale, but I would be very keen to support to make that all members can to ensure that in future we stand the best chance possible of ensuring that licensing committee meetings, which I still believe are a fairly core cool function of the council, to have the best chance of being able to proceed with their business and make the decision necessary. <laughs> Thank you, members. You have the recommendation before you. Um, so I'm going to move to take the vote on the recommendation for this. All of those in favour? <laughs> Any against? None against. Any abstentions? <laughs> one, one abstention, thank you, Jeffs. So, moving on to item number nine, the report of outside bodies. Um, first outside body would be the Development Management Committee. So, I would uh, ask Councillor Foss to introduce the uh, oh, sorry, sorry. report. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Usual. Just a clock day, right this second, a real annoying. Well, shall we move to the? I'll we'll move to the executive. I'll move to the executive. All right.
You switch your microphone on, Councillor Foss. Uh, I'm sorry about this, Chair. It just went and dro dropped right out on me. So, um, it was, no, uh, please, thank you very much. If we had two, if you remember rightly, very close together, we had a very busy month, Chairman. So, this was the first one held on the Development Management Committee on the 25th of May 2022. Two, starting on page, we've well, got page one here, there's probably a different page number on there. Um, and as a rem I move the adoption of the minutes because I don't think there's any recommendations within those minutes. No, they came separate. Um, do you have a second for that? Yeah. yeah, all of those in favour? That's noted, thank you, Jeff. <laughs> Only for note. Um, the executive, uh, part B, Councillor Pierce. Yes. Right. No, I don't do. Yeah, I should do. I know that one. Remember that. Chairman, is this the executive meeting? Look, I've got the one that I've got up at the moment is the 7th of July. Can I do that one and then go back to the one in May? Because I'll find it next. Is that all right? Yes. Right. Thank you. There is one recommendation to council on this, which appears on page 25 of that part of the agenda, um, where it's recommended that this was to do with Totnes Leisure Centre, and it was about the grant of a reversionary lease. And this is to enable solar panels to be put on the roof when the time comes. So, um, so it's recommended that council should grant a reversionary lease to Tadpool for a period from March 2029 to March 243. And so move. So, members, this is the executive meeting on the 7th of July. This is the 7th of July. Yeah, yes. which is section E on this part of the agenda. Do yeah. you have a seconder for the recommendation? Seconded. That's for Baston. Um, all of those in favour? That's 27 in favour of that recommendation. Thank you, Chair. Any against? And one against. So if we can move to part C now, Councillor Foss, do you? Uh, Chair, yes. Sorry, Chef, we do. There's a second recommendation on those minutes relating to the Freeport and Anderson bit language. Oh, sorry. Yep. Oh. Let's get back to them. <laughs> it's on the screen. Oh, so it is. Yes. OK. Councillor Pearson. Yes. Um, the second one. Is that council be recommended to approve the principle of the use of compulsory purchase order process in accordance with the details set out within the published exempt agenda report. Um, and this was fully examined and gone into at that meeting. Um, so I could answer any questions, but I think it was in part two. So um, I prefer it just to go straight through. Do any members wish to speak on that? If not, I'll move to the vote. Uh, so, all of those in favour of the second recommendation? Twenty-seven in favour, thank you, Chair. Any against? Any abstentions? One abstention, thank you, Chair. So, if we can come back to um, the Development Management, Councillor Foss. Yes. Mr Chairman, I present the minutes of the Development Management Committee on the Wednesday the 1st of June, as there's no recommendations, I shall move. Do we have a second of that? Thank you. Councillor Rowe. All those in favour? Those are noted. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, can we move back to the Executive the 26th of May, Councillor Pierce? <coughs> Yes, 
Thank you, Chairman. I'm, I'm sorry for being um, not dodging fast enough. But this recommendation is on page 226 of the main agenda. <coughs> but alternatively, it's as you have it on the screen. And it is regarding the housing crisis and strengthening housing delivery. And the purpose of this was to um, expand the size of the, um, the housing the housing team um, as described in that report and the uh, recommendation was that council be recommended to approve an annual revenue cost pressure of £44,700, that's the South Ham share only, to be built into the budget process from 2023-24 onwards and a one-off expenditure of £150,000, to be funded from the 2021 Government Homeless Prevention Grant. This funding will double the resource of the housing delivery team and drive forward the ambitions of the council in tackling the housing crisis. Do any members wish to discuss the recommendation? Councillor Hodgson. First, I'd just really like to understand exactly what this went on. I mean, I absolutely support that we do something, but I think sometimes it's actually just about actually making sure that we have the housing available rather than or sort of officers talking about it. I'm not being rude about officers at all. Can you put your microphone on? Sorry. I'd just like to understand more about what this money will be spent on because I recognise that to actually provide housing costs quite a lot of money. And I just think it's, it's it's not a huge amount of money, but I just think it needs to be something that's it's actually going to make a real difference. In other words, be invested in, in actual housing. Mr. Brooke, would you be able to give us an answer on that? Chairman, um, uh, yes, yeah, so if the members will recall that um, we have a very uh, resource to do that job very well. We have a housing crisis, and as a result of that, we have ambitions to do more to change the um, tenure and speed with which. The funding goes towards um, government roles, government key role. Planner, so a strategic planner that can engage with um, the RPs that work in this area to bring forward affordable housing led schemes. So they get a preferential service so that we can influence from the beginning, we can work with them, and also reinforce our ability to um, work in. JVs with them. From others' efforts as opposed to doing their own. And so, members, you have a recommendation put before you. Um, I believe, has that been seconded? Okay. No. Can we have. Um, the recommendation proposed by Councillor Pearce. I, I have proposed it already. And seconded, seconded by Councillor Baston. Um, all those in favour? Unanimous. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. So, members, we're now moving on to section D. Sake of the wise peace of mind, don't mind. We haven't actually voted either of those executive meetings. And we do. Um, members, would you like to well, note the minutes of both executive well, meetings? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Those are both noted. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, so we're now moving to item D on uh, agenda item number nine, which is the licensing committee. Um, Councillor Brown to present the minutes. Thank you, Chairman. I herewith present the minutes of the licensing committee held on Wednesday, the 8th of June. Which is on pages 23 and 24 of that particular part of the agenda. Uh, I say move. And there are no recommendations, so it is only for those noting. So those in favour? Those are noted. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, item number 10 public questions. I have received no public questions, so we move on to item number 11. Uh, the two questions received from Councillor Birch. Question one from Councillor Birch to Councillor Pierce. 
Can I ask for a response to be given by Councillor Peters? Can I? <clears throat> yes, Councillor Birch. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm minded to withdraw both my questions as, uh, because of uh, the um, change of circumstances. I, I was uh, tempted to ask permission to amend the first question is, why has this not occurred to, why has this not incurred until now? But I won't pursue that. So uh, <coughs> I'll withdraw the questions. OK, so we move on to agenda item number 12, which is notice of motions. We have two motions on notice that have been received. The first is from Councillor Baston and Councillor Foss. Uh, can I start off by asking Councillor Baston to simply move the motion? I'll move, Chairman. And invite Councillor Foss to second the motion. Second, Chairman. And then Councillor Baston to introduce the motion. Thank you, Chamber, um, uh, Chairman, and thank you, Members, for bearing with me while I just say a few words. At our annual council meeting last May, I put my name forward to be nominated as a council representative on the Slapton Line Partnership, and I was duly elected to represent this council. You may ask what drove me to want to become involved. Frankly, I could not believe the decisions that were being made which were going to affect the economy, the livelihood and social mobility of the residents of the communities between Dartmouth and Kingsbridge. Additionally, it included the destruction of a thing of wonder, and by that I mean Slapton Line and Slapton Lay. Slapton Lay is the largest natural lake in the southwest of England. Although it is only separated from the sea by a narrow shingle bar, it is entirely made up of fresh water. The lake is surrounded by reed beds, marshes and woodland habitats. It is a site of specific scientific interest and was declared a National Nature Reserve in 1993. There is a belief that at some stage the sea will break through the shingle bar and the lake will disappear. However, we do not know what will happen, but where there have been storms that have come close to achieving that. And the Slapton Line Partnership was formed to prepare an adaptation plan ready for this eventuality. During my 12 months on this partnership, I've attended two meetings of little consequence and meaning, and seen an adaptation plan manager arrive and depart. What is beyond belief is that the whole process is being led by the AOMB and the long elected Quangos, the Environment Agency and Natural England. They are happy to see an SSSI and a National Nature, Nature Reserve just disappear. My anger is also directed at the Devon County Council who have done very little to prepare for the eventuality of the A379 being overtaken. And of course, there has been little or no effort to preserve the road. Since the publication of the Council agenda, I've received several emails of support from Street Parish Council and from local residents that we must at all costs retain the Slapton Long Line Road for as long as humanly possible. I would therefore ask you to support this motion and Councillor Foss will have equally strong words to say. Thank uh, you, Chairman. You, Councillor Foss, would you like to speak now or reserve the right to speak later? I think I will speak now, Chairman, as I've got some slides to show the members that, um, just to back up what I'm going to say, we can have the first. This is where we're talking about. Many of you will be well aware of where it is. There's a, shingle, there's a road on the shingle bank, which is some th about 3,000 years old. Um, unlike Councillor Baston, I have been at this ever since I was a parish councillor back in the year 2000, when the road was badly damaged and was repaired. We've had three goals at um, and fine. And the last one was when uh, our previous MP, Sarah Wollaston, managed to get some money from the, from the national government. Uh, it was quite a strange day, actually. Myself and Councillor Brazil and John Hart from the county council were walking up the line 
wondering what we were going to do. And by the time we got to the top and walked back, suddenly this money turned up. Uh, the problem is we get the road repaired, but there is no backup when it comes to what's going to happen in the future. The back roads, if anybody who knows them well, knows that they soon clog it up. In fact, I was there only last week with the uh, our chief executive having a look around and well aware of what the roads are like. Um, I would like longer to speak, but I've got to move along quickly. One of the things we have on there is the memorial, and it is a memorial because I've read the word on there's a lot of dispute about that, to all the local uh, parishes who vacated their land so that the Americans could practice on there. That has to be moved. Now, that is a thing that the Devon County Council should deal with. Not long ago, um, uh, myself and Council Brazil managed to round up the six parish councils to get them to agree to do some maintenance on the new site that was going to be moved. Unfortunately, that's fallen through, not least of which, Dunn County Council still them they've asked planning permission to do anything. They haven't asked to, to get permission to move it to Streetgate Car Park. Um, I could stay a lot. You can see the pictures there. That's the center car park, which is soon ours, which is soon going to disappear. It's one we lease from the Stapton. Well, it's from, I forgot what they call themselves. Maybe they've changed their name, but it used to be uh, the Whitney Trust, but it's moved. It's not called that anymore. Um, and there's a, if you go a little bit further on, Mr. White, I want to show one what's really angering me, and that's the quangles we've got slowing us up. These rocks, and there's another picture there looking the other way, I think, with the, with the steel. Um, yes, those rocks there. I was there with our engineer, Dan Field, uh, and whilst he rang up the guy who's in charge of, the, of Natural England to ask if we could move them from there, where they're doing no good whatsoever, to block up some of the holes further up. And his answer was no. <laughs> uh, we're very, very restricted on what we can do. I know our MP is looking into what he can do for us, but it's absolutely ridiculous. To the extent that I remember one night I had a phone call from the uh, engineer, who, the guy that moves the rocks for us. He does a lot of work for South Island, and he said, we're going to lose the road. We couldn't get out of anybody at uh, this place or the county. And we managed to get the machine down there free of charge one night to put the rocks back. We shouldn't be in that position. There should be a plan to keep the road open as long as possible by putting a few more rocks, by putting good placing. I'm not expecting concrete all the way up. That's not going to happen because of its designation. But also, I expect Devon County Council to actually get off its backside and do something about the back roads because as soon as as was proved when we had a fire in one of the restaurants um, at uh, Tor Cross, it became an absolute nightmare. And in fact, when we lost the road last time, um, there was a restaurant in Dartmouth, Rockfish, whose uh, turnover dropped by 50%. It was the same in Tor Cross, because it means a 20 mile round trip for anything of any size if that road goes. And until we get some better roads in the back, behind this road, I'm asking Dublin County Council to actually get, get on and do something. Thank you. Do any other members wish to speak, Councillor Brazil? Um, yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, as the uh, County Councillor for that area, I, I, I feel I should say something. And, um, uh, you know, and I share the frustrations of, of Richard and, 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 and um, Hillary, that's his name. Uh, <laughs> Um, no, look, uh, the frustration that we have, and, and, you, and you mentioned the quangos here, is that actually it's, it is, it's outside of our control, uh, and this is both at county as well. The Environment Agency in Natural England have said that that's a triple SI and you're not allowed to bring in any foreign materials in order to save the road. And until we get that, that, that designation lifted, there is nothing we can do. If we do get that designation if did, and I, and I know the MP is working on that, then obviously we then need to find the funding for it, because I can assure you that Devon County Council won't be paying for it because, you know, they're, they're pretty much um, up the swanee. Um, but um, 
yeah, I, just just one thing. I mean, Richard talked about that we couldn't get hold of anyone that night. Yeah, actually, we did. We got hold of the county council. This was on the Saturday night, I remember. The storm was coming in that night, or or the Monday morning, or the Sunday morning, and they said, "Well, we can't. We'd we, we be with you on Monday morning." They said. Yeah. Yeah. On Saturday night. Yeah. yeah, Saturday night, yeah, yeah. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't their greatest uh, day. Um, but look, so that's the situation. Um, obviously, uh, we are. A, you know, the Slapton Line partnership, as it says, is a partnership. We can put this forward, whether the rest of the partnership accept it or not. Um, but I think there is growing. Uh, there is a, a, a groundswell of opinion that, that we've got to do more to protect that road um, as long as we can. So I'm happy to support this. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Pierce. Yeah, well, I absolutely support this motion. I think it's really important that the social and economic factors are weighed up against the um, environmental ones. And I think of particular importance is the memorial and um, the manoeuvres that were carried out here by the Americans prior to the um, prior to the D-Day landings. And I've always been fascinated because in the time I've known it, since, even since I was quite young, the beach has always shelved very steeply. But when you look at the pictures in 1940, the beach was quite long and really resembled the Normandy beaches quite a lot. And it is amazing how much it's changed shape in recent years. And I think it's all, uh, again, all to do with this shifting of the sand since they took all that material away from hall sands without realising what the terrible consequences would be. But I almost feel that it's an insult to those soldiers who fought so bravely for us to let this road go, because if they do, it's going to be much harder for people to visit this area. And a lot of people do come down because of the World War II associations. Um, I won't say any more, but my family was quite closely involved in the evacuation and um, the subsequent return of people to the farms. But um, it really is something that we need to fight for. This is part of our heritage, but it is also here and now part of the lives of those people who inhabit those communities, and they do not deserve to be cast aside by unelected quangos. Councillor Hawkins. Um, as the neighbouring county councillors, Julian, uh, I will do all I possibly can if we work together to actually push this. We, um, I remember back in the 1970s, I think 79, 78, uh, we were there the day before the storm and we were there and, you know, we saw how the shingler just completely fallen away. Uh, and then obviously the storm which took uh, a lot of, uh, caused a lot of damage not soon, not long after. I used to be the county councillor, part of Julian's Patch Street in Stoke Fleming, and I remember going to the parish council at Street at this time of year, driving along that fantastic road. It is one of the most beautiful roads in Britain, if not perhaps even in Europe. And I was thinking, gosh, I'm the luckiest man in the world. I'm, I'm representing these communities because it is stunning. And we've really had these quangos take control of us for far too long. We've got to do something now. We are at almost ground zero, aren't we? If we don't do something now, it will be gone forever. It is a beautiful part of the world. Uh, as Julian will know, or Councillor Brazil will know, uh, we've had a wall fall down recently in Stoke Fleming. Thankfully, it was in Julian's patch and not mine anymore. Um, but the trouble that caused and the problem when that bus does not get from Dartmouth to Kingsbridge and off to Plymouth. And we've really, really got to do something. So I'm hoping this council will ask our MP to do all he can, because as Julian says, it's way above county level and it's way above district level. Uh, if we lose this road, the bus service is completely, all the communities along that road will have no, no communications at all. The economy of that part of, the, of South Hams will be completely devastated, as will Dartmouth, as will Kingsbridge, and all the villages along the road. Um, but we've got to make certain that we've got to do those. We've got to ensure that the road is, sa is saved as much as possible and protect those communities along, along that section of road. Um, the tourism would be terribly affected. And yes, we know it's an SSI, but that's really why it should be protected, because it is unique. And 
you know, I think we've all walked around the path that goes around the lake uh, in the years in the past. It's a beautiful part of the world. The environment is amazing. We've got to do all we possibly can. And this is the time perhaps now to actually do it. So if I can help Julian in any way to do that and Southam's, yep, yeah, let's do it. Councillor Hodgson. Thank you, Chairman. I think, you know, the, mo the, you know, the purpose of this motion is very laudable and I, in principle, support it. What I do take exception, though, to is Southam District Council referring to the Environment Agency at L as uh, unelected quangos. They do an incredible job for us in planning. We use them all the time. And I think, you know, while they, they just look at the environmental elements, that's what their job is to do. They are highly professional officers and they give a professional opinion. They have no vested interest either way, but they just say what they see in terms of the environment. And I don't think this is a toss up between the environment and social. I think it's actually benefits both that we could actually look for this being supported. But I'm, I'm, I find it rather distasteful that we actually keep repeating this unexpected, you know, un unnecessary term, you know, unelected quangos. I think it's just being used to be rude. Unfortunately, Chairman, I have to go now. I'm sorry, I've got another appointment. Councillor Smurden. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I would uh, wish to support um, Hillary and uh, Richard in this uh, motion. Um, I think it's very important. It offers uh, the um, importance of, of the road to the area. Um, the area, you know, although I don't live particularly close to it, it's an area, an area that I've known all my life, visited all my life. I was there the night that the tank was hauled out of the uh, the tank was hauled out of the sea, so uh, do know a bit about it. Um, the thing which I find um, uh, difficult to comprehend is that, that there appears to be no uh, movement on improving an alternative route. Um, you know, it, I, I do have great sympathy uh, for people that have to, to, to use this if, if the road is. Um, I can share the experience of the fact, obviously, people would know that I live fairly close to the A38. Um, when on an increasingly um, frequent basis, the A38 is blocked, then the roads around um, my area, my farm, become the diversion route for the A38. Now, I can assure you that that is utter mayhem whilst that is going on. Nothing moves. Um, you know, you can hear you can hear hooting, you know, car horns hooting going on into the night and everything. So I'm, I have great sympathy with that. But we only have that for a short time, you know, it gets put right and, it, and, and everything works again. If the road goes, residents of, of that area along the line will have this, they'll be dealing with this for a long, long time. So I would urge, uh, I, I'd add my, uh, you know, um, you know, my, my uh, feelings to the fact that um, they should be looking at, at, at trying to uh, improve the roads around, you know, the, the rural roads around the back of the lay so that there is an alternative route. That's all right. Well, thank you, Chairman. I'll endorse everything that's already been said. And I do agree with Councillor Smurden that um, uh, the possibility of the back road that goes around the back, which I have on occasion used, which is pretty narrow, and you don't want to meet anything coming the other way unless you can help a bit, because you won't have to reverse quite a long way. But um, I do feel that maybe this should be looked into as an alternative route at some point in time, because we all know that um, this road sooner or later is going to disappear. And every winter when we get bad storms and the wind is in the wrong direction, coming from the east, southeast, I think it will come from to a deep south. Deep south, right, okay, deep south. That will affect the... Um, the storms and wash away even more of the shingle, etc., which is on the beach. I can remember when that beach was um, much flatter and not so shelved as it is now. It has washed away over the years. And I know that a lot of the shingle was taken away um, to help build uh, down in Plymouth and the Plymouth Dockyard many, many, many years ago. And it's never been replaced. And the, the bottom of the sea on that area has been uh, refilled with boulders and the boulders are also on the top, um, which in their wisdom, I'm not sure we put them there, it might be the county council, whoever did it uh, thinks that that's going to save the road. Well, sooner or later, it's going to be washed away. And I do think that provision needs to be made. I can understand about the triple S I and the fact that 
for the environment agency. They won't want it to be um, interfered with. It's got to stay as it is. But I do think that you know something needs to be done. So I totally support the um, motion and let's hope that something can be done. I'm not sure who we're going to take this up with, but it needs to be taken up somewhere. Thank you. Thank you, members. So we have the motion before us, and I intend to move to the vote uh, now. Um, so all those in favour. That's 26 on the list. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, members. So we move to the final motion, which is part B by Councillors Brazil and Baldry. Can I invite Councillor Brazil to simply move this motion to start with? Happy to move it, Chairman. And invite Councillor Baldry to second the motion. Seconded. And Councillor Brazil, if you would like to introduce the motion. Um, yeah, uh, look, I, we've got some amendments here. I don't know if they've been um, put forward that were suggested by Judy. Um, and and uh, Keith and myself were, were sort of reluctantly accepted those, um, but for the sake of unanimity. It's been a long day. Um, I, you know, we, we're happy to go ahead with that. I think the point that we're making is that we all saw during the pandemic how absolutely vital our public servants were. And uh, if we, you know, we really believe in building back better, then we've got to support them. And that includes in having proper wages that they can deal with this cost of living crisis. Um, so, yeah, that's really all I want to say. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, uh, you know, they're the people that need it, not, not um, obviously, but, you know, not executives, uh, uh, you know, which you see pay gangs shooting up, but uh, the people who actually do the work. Um, seem to be um, sadly forgotten. Um, just one plea to to to, me to members over there. Um, obviously, you're going to be choosing the next prime minister in the uh, in the in the near future. Um, yeah, I bet you are. <laughs> but what, what one thing I will say is that I have to be. I've been slightly depressed the way that there's been a sort of Dutch auction amongst the candidates about who's going to top taxes the most. Can I just say that I think that if we what we that's not what the top priority should be. We need to be consolidating our public services, our core public service uh, and, and, and our health service and things like that. So I hope that when you come to vote, whoever it is between maybe Hobson's choice, we never know. But um, but 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 you you know, you look at that because it's not, it's affected this council. But the county council in particular has been so hard hit by austerity measures. But now, to me, the idea of cutting taxes is not the right thing to do. Anyway, I'll leave that there. Thank you very much, Jim. Councillor Baldry, do you wish to speak now or reserve your right? I should speak later in the debate. Thank you. Uh, members, would uh, any members care to... Councillor Holway. Thank you, Chairman. Um, only one little comment, really, and that's regarding the word key workers. I, I think all officers at all levels of this authority have proved themselves to be key workers. So I'd be happy if it just said workers, but I don't want an, an amendment. Just want to pay tribute to the fact that I think all our officers have proved themselves to be key workers over the last and I would just like to thank them. Thank you. Any other members wish to uh Councillor Foss? Yeah, Chairman, I, I, this key workers always gets me a little bit. Where do you stop and start with key workers? Um, health service, fantastic. Teachers, yes, they were all key. They all key to keep things going. Base a whole lot. Um, there's one group that always gets forgotten, and I'm going to mention them now. You know we want to come in. Yes. Farmers. <laughs> <laughs> If you if you haven't got any if you haven't got any food to eat, the, everything else is irrelevant. And like, I don't want to do um, degenerate any other occupation, but I do think that gets forgotten from time to time. That food, and we worked through the COVID situation night and day to keep the food coming in. Dairy farmers still milk their cows. We still grew crops, and uh, through all the rest of it, and. 
Um, I just want. Yeah. I just think need to remind people that occasion okay. because it does tend to get forgotten, and I'm not ashamed to do that. Thank you. Makes sense. Absolutely. I think. Uh, th thank you, Chairman of this Council of Horses. Right, they are key workers in our economy, but unfortunately, their pay does not come from the local government association. Chairman, grateful to the leader and the Conservative Group for supporting our motion. It's watered down slightly, but I think the spirit of it remains the same. Council of Brazil has already mentioned. During the COVID crisis, we expected our key public sector workers to keep going. We expected the NHS staff to do so. We expected the public transport sector uh, to, to, to do so. And especially in our case, because we're interested, our staff in South Hams were outstanding, working under very difficult circumstances. Uh, some, most of them working from home. Often when you spoke to somebody online, you could see a child in the background because the children have been sent home from school. Some of them were working in a back room or in their bedrooms. And on behalf of all councillors, I'm going to say thank you to our staff. But to go on to the motion, I think they deserve a significant pay increase across all those sectors. We have been told in the past there is no magic money tree to produce the money. And then lo and behold, the immediately previous chancellor overcame came that during COVID with furlough schemes uh, and the rest of it demonstrated, in my opinion, that he was a very good socialist. That's one of the things he did. Um, there is money there if we need it. Uh, the gap between the lowest paid and the top in this country has grown and grown. And that is why I'm happy to support this proposal as, as amended. I think the government has got to dig into their pocket and produce more money from the magic money tree and pay our staff and other public sector staff the money they deserve. Thank you. Thank you, members. You have the amendment before you, which I now intend to move to vote on. So, sure. Chairman, we've, Thomas. Accept, we've accepted the amendment. Sorry, Sir Thomas. Sorry, can I, I, I just point out with, with Mr. Fairburn's permission, it occurs to me that I probably should abstain from this because actually you are calling for the worker to get a pay rise. So I didn't really think about it at the time, but actually uh, I'll probably abstain just for the record. So we'll, mo we'll move to the vote on the amendment. All those in favour? No, 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 amendment and acceptance. Can I, can I help, Chair? This, we don't need to vote at all. Uh, this, this, this revised wording has been agreed by the proposed and original seconder, so we're in the realms now of that being the substantive. Right, so we move to the substantive motion. And does any member wish to debate the substantive motion? No. So in which case we'll move to the vote on that and all those in favour. Twenty five in favour, thank you, Chair. Any against? Again. Any abstentions? One abstention. One abstention. So I'd like to thank members for their attendance at the meeting and close the meeting at eleven minutes past five.